Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we're doing Q&A for the month of March 2019 and uh, this is a very appropriate time I thought to do a Q&A video because of everything that's going on. Everyone's kind of freaking out a bit. I mean, not everyone, but um, I'm, I'm sure some of you rational investors out there are very calmly going out and making some investments at cheaper prices, at prices that are appropriate. But there's a lot of people who are not really sure what they're supposed to be doing during all of this crisis stuff and what's going to happen in the future over the next six months or what's going to happen over the next five years. So uh, it's a very appropriate time to bring you the Q&A video for this month. Now, if you're new around here and you're wondering, how can I get my question on this video? I've been watching these videos for a, maybe you've watched a couple of them uh, and you're wondering how you can get a question on here. Well, it's really simple. The first thing you do is you hit the like button and that does absolutely nothing to helping you how to get a question on this. But do it anyway, uh, but in order to actually be able to uh, get a, a question on here, what you want to do is you want to be subscribed, and then basically every month, so in about four weeks time for the next one, uh, I will be making a post on the community board on my channel. So you can either bookmark the community board in your bookmarks and come back and check, uh, or if you're subscribed, it will appear in your subscription box when I make that post. Just drop a comment or question. Uh, question is preferable because it's Q&A, but um, drop a comment on that post. I don't know why I'm making so many stupid jokes. I'm really tired. It's been a busy week, okay? But um, drop a question on that post and uh, I'll answer as many as possible. We had about 30 questions before I, I'm, I'm making this video and I can only squeeze in usually about five or six questions because I like to sort of go quite in depth into each. So I apologize if I missed your question and if I did, feel free to ask it again when I post next month. But with all of that introduction done, let's get straight into the video. So the first question for today is from Stephen and Stephen is asking, for those who have cash saved up in their 401k, when is the right time to enter index funds? Is it better to put all of the cash in at once or dollar cost average the pile of cash over time? And I think this is probably the most common question I've had over the past month. People wondering, do I wait for the market to have fallen 30%, which it has now in the US and, and close to that in Australia? Do I just wait for that? And now do I just dump money in and hope that it's the bottom? Or do I dollar cost average, which for those who don't know, it's the practice of picking a set amount of money and set intervals over the year, maybe it's every week, maybe it's every month or every three months, and just coming back and adding more over time to capture a more of an average price throughout the year and then throughout multiple years, hopefully if you're index fund investing, you're a long-term investor. And my view on this has always been that if you're in an index fund, I think it's very difficult to predict what that index fund will do in the future. So we know that more or less, well, we do know that it's, it's almost certain that those index funds will be higher in 10, 15, 20, 25 years because the index, especially if it's an S&P 500 index or uh, an ASX 300 or ASX 500 index, those businesses, the biggest businesses in the US or Australia will very likely be much more productive as a group in the future and as a result, they'll be producing more profit and their stock prices should be higher in the future, broadly speaking. So, but the point that I was actually trying to get to was that, uh, unlike individual businesses where you can come up with a reasonable expectation of what you can get out of them, we don't actually know when is a good price for per share of that index fund to invest. So I think that when it comes to index fund investing, the best approach is to dollar cost average, no matter what the market is doing whether the market's on a massive one year tear and it's up 30% like it was last year, or whether the market goes down 30% in a month like it did this year, I would just come back every so often, however often your dollar cost average sort of your, uh, your system, your setup is, just come back every single month, every single three months and put in the exact same amount. And over the long term, as the index grows, you will capture an average price and you will do uh, close as possible to the average. If you just stick a ton of money in all at once, you are much more at mercy of the randomness of the stock price on that particular day. And even though the market is down 30%, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be a good time to buy compared to in six months. I don't know, the market might go down another 20%, it might go down another 30%, it might go up 100% for the rest of the year. Who knows what it's going to do? So I would, when it comes to index fund investing at least, 
I would much rather be uh, buying at multiple points to capture an average rather than dumping it in all at once and hoping that you've picked a good time because you might and you might outperform the index or you might not have and you might underperform the index. The next question we've got here is from Bryce and uh, Bryce wants to know, uh, I'm new to value investing and I know that you have a lot of great videos on how to read 10Ks and how to do the actual valuations. But still my question would be, how would you get started? Is there parts that are more important to get down before learning valuation? Or should I just focus on 10Ks and valuation and just jump right in? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And I think a lot of people really have no idea where they should be starting. And when you're getting started, what I would suggest you do, the first thing is, you need to figure out what type of investor you're going to be. And I presume since you're learning about valuation and reading 10Ks, I presume that you're looking to buy individual businesses. So you do, you want to do individual analysis. So that's the first thing. The second thing uh, is that you, you need to understand a strategy at least at a basic level. So that means you might want to read a book such as uh, Warren Buffett's Letters to the Shareholders. That book, I think it's called uh, The Essays of Warren Buffett. That's a nice book that kind of puts all of his uh, teachings over the years since 1964 all into one book. You might want to read uh, Phil Town's book. Uh, there's a number of places you can look on my channel. I have a, a I have a playlist that's called Four Step Stock Analysis, and those videos go through the process. You need to understand what the process is, at least at a basic level of what you're trying to do. Then what I suggest you do is the most important thing is definitely not valuation. Valuation is hard when you don't understand the business, and it's easy when you do understand the business because. The maths can be a little bit confusing, but once you grasp it, what really defines the difficulty of valuation is how well you understand the business. So pick an industry you love, pick an industry you're passionate about, or an industry that you already have a bit of experience in. Uh, I was speaking to someone the other day on the phone who was a, a musician, and I said, that's a fantastic uh, hobby to have because having that passion means that he has a deep understanding of not only musical instruments and those kind of businesses, but also probably the the uh, entertainment industry more broadly. So start in those places and figure out what makes those businesses grow. What makes those businesses run? What are the problems that those businesses consistently face and learn as much as possible about the business? Because the cornerstone of all individual investing is knowing what you're investing in. If you know how much that business is likely going to produce in revenue in the next five or 10 years and how much profit it's going to make and what its margins are going to look like, what the industry is going to look like, what regulation changes are coming. If you know all of those things, then all of that can be used to then work out whether a specific business is a good investment. So that is where I would start uh, if I was a complete beginner. The next question we've got here is, uh, how is the future annual growth rate actually calculated? I tried adding up the one, three, five, and nine year average EPS growth rates and then dividing it by four to get an average, but I don't think that is the correct way. Yeah, so uh, what we're talking about here for those who don't know the context of this question is when we are valuing, valuing a business, what we're trying to do is come up with a total amount of cash that a business can likely produce over the next 10 years. And to do that, we start with last year's cash flow or earnings per share sometimes people like to use, but I prefer cash flow. We start with last year's number and we pick a growth rate so that we can grow it into the future and figure out what is the total amount going to be over the next 10 years. And as a beginner, a lot of people will just sort of suggest, look at the past growth and project that into the future or take an average over the past 10 years and assume that is what the cash flow is going to be in the future. And that's a good way to start, uh, but you're right in that it's really not the correct way to go about it because it's really not enough. Uh, really, you need to be, you need to first have, like I said in the other question, you need a deep understanding of the industry and then you need to take that deep understanding and apply it to figure out what the growth rate might be. So let me give you an example. If you're looking at restaurant companies, what drives growth in restaurant companies is really a, a couple of major factors. One is how many restaurants can they build? The second is what is the revenue going to be generated out of each of those restaurants? And that revenue comes from price increases, menu changes, more traffic coming through the doors. Uh, so you've got those sort of key factors that are gonna, going to drive the top line and then margins depends on things such as wages and food costs and can managers uh, make that very efficient distribution to the restaurants and that sort of thing. So 
that's where that, 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 that sort of gives you a little bit of an insight into what I'm thinking about when I'm analyzing a restaurant company and specifically, I'm looking at, well, if they need to produce, if they're going to grow at 8%, Where's that going to come from? Is it 4% from more people coming through the door? Is it 1% from menu price increases? Is it 2% from the number of restaurants that they're able to expand into the US or internationally? Those are the kinds of questions that I'm thinking about. And that way, if you go down that line of thinking and if you deeply understand the business, then you will come up with a much more accurate growth rate. Uh, but this is something you just develop over time. And again, it comes back to researching and understanding the industry that you're investing in as much as possible. The next question we have here is, uh, should we buy this dip? Will it be profitable to buy shares now? Uh, it could be a very long time for companies to return to profitability. This is not an ordinary dip. It is a global recession. All right, so there's a couple of questions there. Um, to quickly answer, will it be profitable to buy shares now? Uh, well, it, it depends what shares you're buying. Uh, there's no way that, that there's an answer to that question broadly. Um, and even if you gave me a specific business, I can't 100% tell you if that business is, if it's going to be profitable to buy that business now. Uh, I can only come up with a hypothesis, an opinion, an analysis uh, that is based in facts and come up with an opinion. The second thing is, should we buy this dip? Well, again, it depends on what business you're buying. If you're index fund investing, like I said in the first question, I don't think that you should be trying to pick when it's going to stop falling. I think that you should just accept that the index fund will likely go up over the long term and just buy at regular intervals, which means that this dip really means nothing to you. If the time comes for you to invest in the index fund, you buy it. If it's not time, you don't because you're, you're trying to capture an average. But if you're talking about individual businesses, you should buy into this dip if well, you should buy into the dip if the price has fallen into a place where you are very confident you're going to make a particular return. Investing is entirely about return. What am I getting back from what I'm outlaying right now? And you might be able to get the stock at a cheaper price today, but that doesn't necessarily mean that just because the stock is 30% cheaper, that it now offers a decent return over the long term. Maybe it offered a terrible return before, and now it's a little bit less terrible. So, it depends on the individual business or it depends if you're index fund investing, in which case you would just continue to dollar cost average as you have been uh, and as you plan on doing for the next, for the foreseeable future. Also, just one other thing on this question, you say that it's not an ordinary dip, it's a global recession. Well, that's, first of all, that's to be seen. We we don't, we're not in a recession yet. We, maybe the likelihood of the recession, of a recession coming has gone up. But even if it is a recession, that just means that it might last 18 months instead of six months. But does that really matter if you're a long-term investor? Does that really matter unless you want to pull out your money uh, within the next six months, which I think is highly risky if you're investing in the stock market, expecting to be able to pull your money out. Um, if it's a global recession, um, of course, that's not a nice thing. It's not good. People lose their jobs. Businesses go out of business. And I completely sympathize with that. Uh, but if there is a global recession, then it, then it provides us the opportunity to invest in great businesses while they are going through a short-term problem, while less customers are coming through the door, while they're generating less revenue, while their expenses might have gone up, while they're generating less profit. But that for the next 18 months might be terrible, but if they're a great business, the customers will come back in two, three, four years down the road, and in 10 years time, this will just be nothing. It'll be something in the distant past that will not be impacting the business on an ongoing basis. The next question here is, uh, how bearish are you and why, why not? Um, yeah, so bearish as in, do, do I feel as if the market's going to go down? Well, in the short term, I have no idea. And anyone who tells you whether they they know anyone who tells you that they know the stock market's going down over the next six months or it's going up in the next six months is crazy. Don't listen to them. Unsubscribe to anybody who says that to you. If you're talking about the long term and you're talking about, say, the US or the Australian economy, I'm very bullish. I am very bullish on the US and Australian economy uh, because this is, again, a short term impact that will not stay with most businesses. Most businesses will survive through this. It doesn't matter if it lasts 18 months. Most businesses will come out the other side, their customers will come back, and their revenues and profits will continue to grow, at least broadly speaking. Of course, there are some individual businesses that I might feel bearish over the long term if they have too much debt and they're particularly exposed to this type of event. Um, but uh, no, I'm not bearish at all. And uh, I'm very positive about the fact that I can make investments at 
cheaper prices at better prices for the businesses I understand and that will ultimately improve my long-term return. And the last question that we have time for here is uh, from Matt. Uh, hey mate, uh, should we be selling a company that has risen above its intrinsic value if the company hasn't changed and is still great uh, and we have no other investments that meet our requirements? Should we sell and wait for another company or hold and let it compound? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is it depends on your definition of intrinsic value. So for example, uh, Phil Town's definition of intrinsic value is double the price that you are willing to pay. Whereas that's not necessarily my definition of intrinsic value. And I think that that is certainly not the intrinsic value definition from Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's intrinsic valuation and mine for that matter is that the intrinsic value is the total amount of cash you can expect to get out of a business over its remaining life discounted at, uh, at the risk-free alternative, uh, which at the moment, the risk-free alternative on the 10-year US Treasury yield is 1%. So more or less, the intrinsic value of a business today is the total amount of cash that it can return to you in the future. Um, and in that circumstance, if a business's price was substantially above, I'm talking about quite a bit above its intrinsic value, meaning that you feel very confidently that you could get more for that business now than what it could return to you over its remaining life, which doesn't happen very often. But if that is the case, then yeah, I would I would start to sell some of those businesses. But for the most part, I'm looking to hold on to businesses as long as possible because I don't want to limit the upside of a business that I've conservatively valued. When I come up with an intrinsic valuation, it's always very conservative. It's like a, it's, it's almost like a worst case scenario. It's a situation that I think, yes, nine times out of 10, this company hits that. They produce that amount of cash. So if they exceed that, then I'm usually not too surprised because if they exceed the amount that I'm saying is very conservative, that just means that they're doing well. And I don't want to cap my investment by taking it out of businesses that are just doing well, because ultimately we're trying to find businesses that are really great. So even though my valuations are very conservative, I ultimately hope that there is a lot more upside to those businesses. So I guess to answer your question, most of the time I'm holding onto those businesses. Um, and particularly if you're in the case where you have no other investment opportunities, then I'm also presuming you have some cash around already. So instead of just adding to that cash pile and letting it build up to way too much cash, hold on to some of those great businesses and let them compound over the long term. Thanks everyone for watching today's video. I know that I can't get to every single question and I wish I could. Uh, maybe I could do a Q&A video that just goes for an hour or two hours or something insane where I just sit down, not, not, uh, not chopped up into little pieces and I can just sit down and go through and answer like, 50 questions or something. If that's something you're interested in, make sure you let me know down in the comment section below. Maybe I can do it live as well or something like that. We'll see. But uh, other than that, I'll be back next month, of course. And if you have a question or if you had a question for this month, but it didn't get answered, then make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you hit the like button if you enjoyed this content. Make sure you're subscribed though, so that you can see the post when I post in the community board. Uh, and uh, that way you can ask your question and hope that it gets answered. But uh, thanks everyone for watching and I hope you guys have a great day.